Good morning. It is Tuesday, September the 24th, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much, and I'm Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today because I'm the only one who is, uh, makes the presumption for the status quo. This, as opposed to reactionary traditionalists like Rush Limbaugh, who resist change at all costs. My podcast is about being a true conservative and using true conservatism to beat the left each and every day. My podcast is made possible by Spreaker.com. It can be heard on iTunes, Spotify, Google, and YouTube. My email address is storytimes at hotmail.com. I'm on Twitter at Ronald Hardgrove and on Facebook at The Drill. I started my socio-political odyssey as a conservative Republican, became a card-carrying member of the Libertarian Party, and now I'm a registered independent and true conservative. I was taught initially by the left how to dress, how to act, what to take seriously, and who to associate with. So when I decided to vote Republican, I thought that I could act liberal but vote conservative and still consider myself a conservative. In other words, I thought I could have my cake and eat it too. I was wrong. Whenever I engaged a liberal in debate, I couldn't win. And I couldn't win because I couldn't be taken seriously and because I didn't understand the debate dynamic between left and right. I talked conservative, but I acted left. I used lefty lingo, I dressed like the left, and I engaged in petty vice and associated with people who engaged in vice. People who used drugs, gambled, consorted with prostitutes, stole, and cheated. I failed to recognize that the debate dynamic was between psychology things that are imaginary, and philosophy, things that are real. It was no wonder that the people around me didn't take me seriously. So I realized that defeating the liberals and socialists starts with getting my act together by not only voting conservative, but talking, dressing, and acting conservative, by refusing to associate with common criminals and 'er ne'er-do-wells, by being aware of and resisting left-wing counterculture and by using my intellect to defeat psychological bullying and intimidation. By becoming a true conservative, I will not only win, I will never lose. The purpose of my podcast is to share with my audience the lessons I learned on how to defeat the left each and every day. Today, I will be looking at the Scandinavian teenager at the UN and continue reading Chapter 4 of A False Kind of Christianity by Dan Jensen, covering... The basics of deduction, the basics of imperial investigation, the basics of right and wrong, and the basics of greater and lesser when I come back. And thank you very much. Welcome back. Yesterday, a snotty 16-year-old brat from Scandinavia was allowed to lecture an adult audience at the United Nations. This lecture represents a typical left-wing technique to exercise power called I Dare You, using a subversion known as weakness is strength. Normally, the I Dare You technique is used by schoolyard bullies, the biggest kids in school. Here, the left is using as their champion a petite high schooler. The left is using a cultural taboo as a weapon and shield, the taboo against hitting children. Hitting in this context could also mean embarrassing or humiliating. The way to defeat this bluff is best explained by using an imaginary conversation. If anyone ever tries to use this bluff on you, this is the way to defeat it. Socialist brat. Climate change violates our rights. True conservative. So what? Socialist brat. So, you don't care. True conservative. No, I don't. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know why? Because you have no authority, no power, and you can't win. And that conversation represents the right way to handle the situation because it recognizes and confronts a psychological power play. Remember, when dealing with lefties, listen not to what they're trying to say, but what they are trying to to do. When I return, I will continue reading chapter four of Dan Jensen's book, A False Kind of Christianity, including the basics of deduction, the basics of imperial investigation, the basics of right and wrong, and the basics of greater and lesser. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. And now I continue with chapter four, A False Kind of Christianity. And uh, when I left off yesterday, I had covered the basics of truth, the adequacy of human language, the law of non-contradiction, the law of causality, and the basic reliability of sense perception. And so now we continue with a false kind of Christianity, which is a conservative evangelical refutation of um, Protest or uh, progressive Christianity. The basics of deduction. Deduction refers to drawing inferences based on previously established premises. The inference is not stated explicitly, but if the premises are true, then the inference or conclusion follows as a matter of course, even though it has not up until that time been made explicitly clear. <clears throat> the process of making an inference, namely having at least two proven premises that lead inexorably to a conclusion, is known as a syllogism. An example of a syllogism would be to say that John always wears his red tie on Tuesdays. It is Tuesday, and therefore John is wearing his red tie today. Premise A is that John always wears his red tie on Tuesdays. Premise B is that it is Tuesday. The inference or conclusion is that he's thus wearing the red tie today. It follows as a matter of course, even if no one has explicitly said this. It is very important here to understand that the conclusion is only true if the premises are true. If one of the premises is false, then we may be correctly deducing the necessary inference, but the conclusion may still be false. If John does not always wear his red tie on Tuesdays, but instead always wears his black tie on Tuesdays, then it may have, uh, I may have correctly deduced the necessary inference from the premises, but my conclusion is still false because it was based on a faulty premise, namely premise A. When this happens, we say that the conclusion is valid but not true. That can be confusing because when we use the word valid, we usually think of something as being correct or right. But we're we're trying to convey here is that one thing is using the powers that one is using the powers of deduction correctly. The problem is one of the premises. This is why we must be careful to make sure that our premises are correct before making inferences. We must also distinguish between a possible inference and a necessary inference. Technically speaking, deduction only refers to when we are making necessary inferences. But it is important to understand the difference here because without this understanding, a great deal of confusion often results. A possible inference is where a conclusion is tentative but makes good sense, given the premises. It is often good to make possible inferences that can support our other conclusions. But we cannot be dogmatic about them since they are only highly probable possibilities. The same is not true with necessary inferences. Necessary inferences cannot be denied if the premises are, in fact, correct. Not understanding the difference between these two concepts often leads people to be rather fuzzy on the concept of implicitness, a concept that is very important. Today, unfortunately, if someone says that something is implied, most immediately uh, tend to think that this something is less certain. But that is not always the case. If something has been stated explicitly, then there's no question about the meaning. But if something is stated implicitly, then the person's meaning may or may not be clear. This is because it depends on whether or not the inference being implicitly drawn is a possible inference or a necessary inference. If it is a possible inference, then we cannot be absolutely sure regarding the meaning. But, and this is where many get tripped up or try to wriggle their way out of having to believe something, If the inference is a necessary inference, the meaning is just as clear as if the person made the statement explicitly. We have no more right to disregard an implicit but necessary inference than we do a statement made explicitly. The basics of imperial investigation. Imperial investigation refers to the making of sound conclusions based on our explorations of the world around us. The empirical sciences differ from the formal sciences in that one has to go out and investigate the world in order to fill in the context or the content of those subjects. Formal sciences like philosophy and mathematics can be applied to the world and, in some sense, interact with the world. But for the most part, they refer to what we know instinctively and or to the necessary inferences we draw from these instincts without recourse to the natural world. However, the empirical sciences, such as history, archaeology, sociology, biology, chemistry, etc., require us to deeply explore the world. No one can know by sheer instinct 
for example, that Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. We have to admit that most were told that this is true by someone they trusted and believed it solely on that basis. But if we are honest with ourselves and really thought about it, we would realize that we cannot know this for sure unless we investigate the evidence for ourselves. Once this is done, one, once we can, one, we, one can see that Abraham Lincoln was in fact the 16th president of our country beyond all doubt. The key thing to remember here is how finite our knowledge is when it comes to empirical data, the bits of information we receive when investigating the world. We never have all the information, only God does. And most of the time, even the information we do have is very limited. We often make tentative conclusions based on this limited data that unfortunately have a way of becoming fact in our language or culture, when in reality these facts are anything but facts. This is why so often what one generation believes is fact is discarded by the next generation as incorrect. We must be very humble and careful when labeling something as a fact. With all that said, if something has uh, overwhelming empirical evidence behind it, like old A being our 16th president, then we can know that this is a fact beyond all doubt. Um, and as a quick aside here, he is uh, basically prescribing a, a skeptic, a skeptical kind of uh, way of dealing with knowledge and its BS. Not only is there certainty of knowledge, there is nothing but certainty of knowledge. Uh, the way to deal with the fact that's not a fact is simply be able and willing to admit that you're wrong. Okay, so you come out and you say, Abraham Lincoln is 16th president of the United States. This is what I've gotten from my history book. Now, if somebody can prove that somebody else was the 16th president of the United States, then I should admit that I'm wrong and correct my mistake. The basics of right and wrong. We cannot here go into every moral principle that God has instinctively given to us. What we can say here is that all of us know deep down, sometimes only very deep down, that all of our actions are either right or wrong. The degree of goodness or the degree of evil is not always the same, but every action is always good or evil. We also instinctively know that these moral instincts we have can only take us so far. We know instinctively that God asks more of us than the basic moral requirements. He is placed upon our hearts and that uh, we must seek him for his further revelation in order to know how to fulfill these further requirements. The basics of greater and lesser. By greater and lesser, I do not mean mathematically. I mean it in the sense of grandeur. So, for instance, we all instinctively know that it is greater to exist than not to exist. We all instinctively know that it is better to be morally good than morally evil. We all instinctively know that it is better to be perfectly and infinitely morally good than to be less than that. We all know that it is better to have knowledge than to not have knowledge like the rocks. We all know that it is better to have knowledge than not to have all, to have all knowledge than not to have all knowledge. And we can go on for some time. We'll explore this area in much more detail when we come to the section on perfection. So um, that uh, concludes this particular part of chapter four on philosophy from the book um, A False Kind of Christianity. And uh, I like this uh, particular chapter because it uh, demonstrates the foundations of not only Christianity, but of all intellectual endeavors. And uh, so next time I'm going to be covering, uh, the next part of the chapter is about the existence of God. So back in a minute. Thank you. In conclusion, I have shown you how to deal with the left-wing technique of I dare you and reinforce the importance of philosophy and philosophical theory by reading from chapter 4 of A False Kind of Christianity. All of the subjects I've covered today are subjects that could and should be covered by Rush Limbaugh and his ilk. Who is the true conservative? He is the person that understands that conservatism is not just about politics, uh, but is about culture as well. He acts like an adult. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He is open-minded, asking why rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential. Not ashamed of his existence, 
unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He is a normal American. And that brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. Thank you for listening, and have a great day.